So, uh, we've been talking about sin. Before I go any further, that P means prayer. So, I'm going to pray. Father, thank you that we are here. Thank you that we can do this. As we thank you every single week that we can do this, it is a pleasure and an honor and a blessing. God, I pray that everything we discuss, uh, that you would just fill us uh, and come alongside us with a, with a sense of intellectual honesty and love for each other um, and just a desire to understand and a desire to seek out understanding. We love you, Lord. Yes. Amen. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll put this out there. I was, I was reading recently. This is sort of related, but not really. There's always the big discussion of you know, how far should you seek to understand? How far should you take a discussion, you know, does this stuff really matter, that kind of thing. Um, and obviously I come from the stance that it is super important. Like, I mean, I, I, I at least consider it really, really important to blaze on and try to understand, even if you're running into a wall. Um, you know, if everybody stopped thinking when they ran into an apparent wall, we would never really get anywhere. And that doesn't just apply to theology, that applies to a whole lot of things. But uh, somebody made a point. I was listening to a teacher and he made the point that uh, we're, we're not, God actively encourages us seeking out understanding, especially in his ways and understand how he works and what he's doing. And there's a, a uh, statement that Jesus made where he said, uh, God, we're no longer servants, but we're friends. Yes. The difference being a servant does not know what his master is doing. A servant just closes, eyes, closes his eyes and does it. A friend knows what his master is doing. A friend is in tune with his master's plan and is able to do that and then freely continue propagating that, if that makes sense. Um, so we're not, God doesn't even want us to be blind followers. He wants us to be people who seek out understanding and who have the understanding and who are able to blaze forward with it. Yeah. So, with that in mind, we've been talking about sin. Seeing the funnest thing to talk about in Christian discussion. Sin. And we talked about a lot of stuff uh, regarding it. Probably, I guess we're what? This is week four, maybe? Four? Something like that? I thought it was three. Maybe three? It's definitely not three. It's at least four, possibly five. Yeah. Probably feels four. Like, feels like five. Might be five. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. We've had lots of sin discussion. It's been good. I tried to watch last week on YouTube. It wasn't posted yet. Yeah. We, You're busy. It's all good. Uh, yeah, we're, we're behind. Um, we're getting cut up there. We've been talking about sin and what it is and the misconceptions that come with it, all of that good stuff. And But there's a few things that we have talked about up to this point to at least give us an idea of, uh, or at least get us closer to an idea of how to define it. And so what we looked at is, uh, the first big concept we looked at is the fact that God hates it. Yes. At the very least, we know that God hates whatever sin is. Uh, there's... It's just throughout the Bible, God says, oh, you're a God that hates wickedness. You're a God that despises unrighteousness. So on and so forth. And the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at why, which is a question that not, or it's not asked enough. Why, really anything, especially why does God do this? But I really look at God's motives. And so when you're talking about God hating sin, especially as passionately as God hates sin, apparently, why? And so we looked at three possibilities. One, why does God tell us to do something and not others? Why does it hate sin? One, when you're looking at like the law and stuff like that, it is arbitrary. Obviously, the law is the opposite of sin, ish, sort of. At the very least, it defines what sin, what things are sin for us to do. And so, why does God hate sin? Why does God tell us to do something instead of others? The first idea is that it's arbitrary, that He doesn't really have a reason. He just kind of picked out, okay, this is how it's going to be. You do this because I told you to. The second big reason, God gives us the law in order to show us how sinful we are. So, to show our depravity. And finally, God hates sin. He gave us the law in order to help us. In order to show us how to live in such a way that we're going to be able to function and not get hurt. In other words, God hates sin because it hurts us. So, gave us a lot to help us function, to help us live. Um, I may have missed this last week, but one of you kind of seemed like the same thing to me. No. 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 This one, arbitrary means without reason. Mm. To show our depravity would mean showing us the importance of grace. Mm. Okay. 
Like, you guys are depraved, you're sinful, you can never reach my standard, so you need Jesus Christ. You need okay. the grace to come and fill in the gap that you can never fill in. Okay. Solo fide. Faith alone. That is the grace. There's no, no doing anything involved because we can't do anything. Yes. And then finally, the law is given out as an actual, okay, please follow this because it will help you, it will bless you. Now, I gave you guys my opinion last week. For those of you who are here, my opinion, and it's a very strong opinion, is that it's number three. Now, you're free... Number three is to help us to live, to, help, to show us how to live and function in reality, to show us what our design is like. And you guys are free to disagree with me, um, but not without honestly examining what you believe. I don't care if you walk out of here disagreeing with me, but I do care if you just shut your ears and don't listen to anything. The same way that I approach this. Um, I believe this because I, th I think God, that's what God says right? in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. He says, if you would only have such a mind as this to follow the things I'm telling you to do, everything would go well for you and for your descendants always. Mm -hmm. and Moses says the chapter before that, he says, God gave us these statutes for our good always, that he might preserve us alive. And so and to me, the biblical message is really, really clear that it's this one. Now, there are people who are biblical scholars who will disagree with me very, very strongly. So you guys have to be willing to examine that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but no, this is where I stand, right here. So we talked about how, at the very least, at the very least, regardless of, well, God gave us a law, so on and so forth, at the very least, we know sin hurts us. Yes. At the very least, we know God hates it because it's destructive, right? Yes. God doesn't want us to do it. Would you agree with that? Yes. Because it hurts us. Because it's bad, it's destructive, it's, it's just bad for him, it's bad for us, it's bad for everyone else. When we sin, it affects a lot of people. So, when we're talking about the fact that sin hurts us, and that was summary, just there. If you're wondering why, oh my gosh, it's going so quick. I'm trying to catch up a little bit. When we're talking about the idea of uh, sin hurting us, uh, how... So in your life, when you have screwed up, when you have sinned, or when people around you have sinned and it's affected you, how, how has it hurt you? How has it been destructive from what you've seen? For me, it's distorted my view of God. Hmm. Yeah. Certain, certain things. Damage his trust. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think that's the reason behind things like thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not lie. Or what is one of the reasons? It separates. It takes up a lot of space in your heart and mm -hmm. in your mind. It separates. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. You said I think it distorts messes with your view of God. I think that's true about reality in general. Mm -hmm. I think sin can distort what you see. I know people who are totally slaves to their messed up lifestyles. Yes. And they live in some place... I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what they see. I don't know how they perceive reality, but it's apparently not the same way that I do because it's impossible to talk to them. Yeah, yeah, I think all those things are true. Uh, we talked about this last week as well, but I think it has a cumulative effect on our character. I think it builds against us. I think when you find a person who has been doing the same garbage over and over and over and over again, they are very, very much entrenched in that garbage. Yes. I think it works both ways. When you find a person who has been choosing patience for years and years and years, you'll find that they're a thoroughly patient person. So again, if you find a person who's been choosing bitterness and unforgiveness or pride over and over and over again, to those destructive means, you'll find a dysfunctional life and you find a thoroughly bitter, unforgiving, or prideful person. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You ever met a person like that? Yes. Oh, yeah. I was a person like that. So cumulative yeah. destructive behavior ultimately will destroy us. That's yeah. what step study and CR and sure. habits, hang ups, they all and some sometimes we have to go and learn about why we do that. 
Yeah. I, I had great revelations through those classes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I know mean, no why. Yeah, knowing why and then knowing how to quit. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just don't know how to quit. Mm -hmm. Habits are hard to break, guys. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can tell you that. <laughs> They're hard to break. But, again, habit is not a negative thing. It is a thing. And just like anything, yes. it can have good and evil yeah. to it. Um, when you look at the flip side, those people who are thoroughly patient... It's really hard to shake them out of their impa or out of their patience because that's their habit. They don't even have to think about it. They're just patient. So habit's a good thing, but sin can push us in one direction, push us in another direction, and kind of build, develops us, develops, uh, affects our growth. Um, I think, I think probably the biggest thing we're talking about how sin hurts us. And is destructive. It separates us in some sense from yes. God. Yes. Now that's a really interesting one. When you think about what exactly that means, and it is a biblical concept. Isaiah fifty nine verse two says, "Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. Your sins have hidden His face from you." Mm -hmm. And when you talk about exactly what that means, uh, it's pretty interesting discussion. Or what does it mean that we're separated from God? I mean, well, does it mean if I died today, then I'd be going to one place instead of another? Does it mean that God can't hear me when I talk to him? Does it mean that God won't listen to me? Does it mean that he won't have anything to do with me? What does it mean exactly? And I don't know. I don't know. Now, I mean, I, I do know, at least in terms of relationship, Relationship, at least human relationships, when you have a fracture in a relationship, they can't move forward or continue in any meaningful way until the relationship is, until it meets reconciliation, which requires forgiveness, which is why forgiveness is such a core part of Christianity, right? We've sinned, we get forgiveness, and we're back into the relationship we were created to live in. But at the very least, we know that sin does separate us from God. That seems to be probably the biggest one. As far as exactly the, the details of that, it's a little bit vague, yes. but we have a, at least a general idea. It separates us from God. Okay, so when we're talking about, I, I, I said, I, I've mentioned this before multiple times, but I, I believe that sin, well, I'll pose this in the form of a question. When you're talking about smart things versus dumb things, <laughs> when you're talking about intelligence versus stupidity, where do you think what we did, what we describe as sin would fall on that spectrum? Stupidity. Stupidity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can say that it's probably stupid. Um, to put it another way, do you think there's ever a case in which sin is a worthwhile decision? Yeah. I mean, there's a knee jerk. No. Mm. But then you think about it. Yeah. Is there? Like the better decision? Is, is, say it again? Is it, you think there's ever a case in which sin is the better decision? Well, not by the definition we have. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you my opinion. I, I, don't think, I think the answer is no. I think if it was a better decision, it wouldn't be sin. Yes. Because God is always, when you look at God's laws and his commandments to us, it's always, really, he's, he's simply telling us the best way yes. to do things. It's not a power trip. That's what arbitrary means. It's a power trip. Do this because they said so. And at least in my opinion, it's not to show us how worthless we are, how little we can obey him. I think he's really just saying, hey, look, here's the best way. I'm showing you. Like we do with our kids, with our friends. Look, hey, no, no, that's not how you do it. Do it this way. So I, I think if sin were a better decision than some other thing, then it wouldn't be sin anymore. It would just be the right decision. So, but that's the thing, though. We say sin is stupid, right? We say it's unintelligent. We say it's, it's dumb, it's destructive, and it hurts. But there's, there's a question. I mean, I, really, I think most of the time when we say it's just really stupid. When we personally say it, I think most of the time, it's really, really dumb. We just, there's no justification whatsoever. 
but yet we choose it. Right? Is there anyone here that doesn't? At least at some point or another. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Will I? I hope not. <laughs> I think we can say that. If I had to put a bet on it, I would say I'm probably going to mess up again sometime before I die. And sometimes Maybe after that. <laughs> Say again? Sometimes it's unintentional. I mean, you can look at some of the old, in the Old Testament with some of those sacrifices, and some of it was for unintentional sin. Mm -hmm. that they didn't realize they were doing. They yeah. I will say this. When you look at the definition of the word there, there's a difference between what we call sin and what was translated sin according to the, the King Jimmy version. Oh. So there's like a transgression. So it's a, here's the fence, and here's jumping over the fence. You can do. You can jump over a fence intentionally, or you can jump over a fence unintentionally. I think what we're talking about, and what Jesus talks about in the New Testament, I don't think these are considered the same thing. Oh, okay. I don't think. And this is my opinion. Uh, I wouldn't say they both fall into the same category. Uh, I'll give you. We're jumping ahead a little bit here, but I would say. That sin, what Jesus calls sin, what Paul calls sin, is always an intentional, conscious action against what we know to be true. Mm -hmm. And I'll just I'll throw this one out there. And this is also jumping ahead a little bit. But James says this. He says, to him who knows what to do and does not do it, to him that is sin. Yes. So what, 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 what's the really important part that's included in there? You know what he knows. Knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah. Here's the thing. You can do something wrong that you can infringe upon laws that you never knew existed. Yeah. When I was younger, I didn't understand what jaywalking was. <laughs> so I jaywalked all the time. Now when I was told, hey, you know that's illegal, right? Oh, crud. <laughs> that's wrong. I shouldn't be doing that. Paul says in Romans, now the law increased sin. Hmm. Why? Because, because suddenly you know. Oh, it's very clear. It's That's wrong. I shouldn't be doing that. Hmm. So now even though I know it, what happens when I still jump over it? Yeah. It increases that. Yes. To him who knows what to do, and on the flip side, because it doesn't work just one way. To him who knows what not to do, and does it anyways, to him that is sin. Well, how does this fit? How does that fit with the general populace? I mean, we're, we're talking here about um, Christian people seeking knowledge, right, of God. And you have people that are atheists or are non believers. Maybe, you know, they don't believe one way they don't pay any attention to God. Um, they're, you know, God, I understand biblically, God expects us to be able to view his creation and recognize the Creator. When you, is the ignoring then the creator, does that put them in the sin if they don't have a knowledge of? There's a very big problem. There's a very, very big problem with us discussing who is guilty for what. Mm -hmm. Because none of us can say what one person's knowledge is. Mm -hmm. right. Knowledge is at any one point. Right. And the biggest variable in all of this is what God calls the conscience. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest single variable. Because it is a very vague thing that you can't pin down. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So what a conscience is, is this thing that's somewhere telling you what is right and wrong. Paul says in Romans that God ingrained upon the hearts of every single human being to some degree at least what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Now apparently, it's not so strong that it didn't need clarification, which is why God gave the law, right? Apparently it's something that can be muted turned down to a dull hum. Mm. Which is why the law was put into place in the first place. So it can be very clearly identified. But we, we don't know. If you point at this guy and says, look, 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 at, look at how very little he knows. To what degree does God hold him guilty? I, mm. I couldn't tell you, and neither could any other human being on earth. Neither could that guy individually. God could. So I don't think it's our, it's our responsibility to say, he didn't know this, and so does God hold him guilty or not. Here's what I, I, I would say. In terms of genuine responsibility, 
is if I responsibility, and then so this is where it's really tricky. He's like, well, should you have learned that jaywalking was a crime? Should you have known? Was it your negligence that resulted in you not knowing that jaywalking was a problem in the first place, and therefore you are truly guilty? Judge, but if you I take to say that ignorance of the law isn't an excuse, <laughs> there's, a, there's an argument to be made of that. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Mm. I think instinctively, if we're not Christians, your conscience will say. This is wrong. Yeah. But well, again. The answer to that is that person that, who's not a Christian does not want to even acknowledge God. So, you know, you can hold them, you know, accountable. Yeah, you're accountable and you know what you're doing, but he has no, he has no accountability to God. He doesn't feel that. He doesn't feel that like we do. We don't, we feel the sense of sin. We feel the sense that we don't want to do anything wrong. But for somebody who doesn't believe, it's like, I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, most of the, like, pretty much every militant atheist I've ever talked to, including myself in the past, has, you know, been quick to say that, you know, the conscience is ingrained, and whether you want to call that a biological evolutionary process or if you want to acknowledge that it came from God, I think every, pretty much everyone can agree it's there inside you. We, choo we choose to acknowledge that it came from a creator. Yes. Some people don't choose to acknowledge that, but they still feel it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. But that's the thing. But what what I just said there with what James said, this is not like a, an author commenting on scripture. This is scripture. And so he lays it out pretty clear there. I think that's a crucial part of the definition of what sin is. To he who knows what to do and does not do it. Right. And therefore, to he who knows what not to do and does it anyways. That is what a sin is. It involves a conscious trend. If you look at the definition as used in both the Old and New Testament, it's always a transgression. Yes. It's always a missing the mark. Whatever word that's rendered, uh, yes. rendered as sin in the English, it's always one of those Shades of meaning. So, once again, as far as who is guilty in God's eyes, not really our business. Well, it's it's <laughs> not our it's not our business exactly. Now, I would be willing to say this in terms of what what responsibility and guilt means. Mm. I I would, and this is not like a concrete example here, but I I wouldn't be bothered if God someday told me, oh hey, there was this kid who was raised in an environment in which everyone cursed. Yeah. Everyone cursed and nobody didn't curse. And that was all he knew from age 30, or from his birth to age you know, 20 or something. I wouldn't be bothered in the least if he told me. And then at age 20, he had a conversion experience and became a Christian and started hanging out with people. And suddenly, his, he became convicted about this whole cursing thing. And from that point on, he didn't curse anymore because it was wrong for him to do it. I, I wouldn't be so bothered at all if God told me, and I, I, you know what, all that stuff from before, I don't hold it against it. No. 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 I wouldn't be bothered. No. No. That's not now saying. that involves knowing, at least in your head to some degree, what was, what's right and what's wrong. Yes. Now Paul talks about this when you're talking about eating uh, meat given to idols, mm -hmm. strangled meat, so on and so forth. He says, look, if it's fine for you, it's fine for you. But to them, they don't believe it's fine. So don't do it in front of them. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us would say, look, just explain to them, the people who think it's wrong, why it isn't wrong. But Paul didn't say that. He said, apparently their level of knowledge and your level of knowledge is going to dictate what is right for you and wrong for them. Now, maybe later on, one of them comes to a point where you're like, wow, this is actually not a problem at all then it's no longer a problem. Here's what I think. I think in terms of like our mind and our conscience, any kind of transgression over what this says is right, even if it's not a big deal in, in the big scheme of things, damages, yes. damages our conscience and our mind. Yes. And I think even that is destructive. Yes. And therefore it is a sin. Which is really getting crazy here. Because then sin isn't just a list of things. No. Oh no. It's a feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Sin is an intention of the heart. Yes. Yes. Here's a question. Let's say I know a guy named Bill. And I know a guy named Chuck. Now Bill graduated high school and he's a Christian and he is going to go off to seminary. Good on you, Bill. Now Bill wants to go to seminary so that he can learn more about God and so that he can understand God's ways and understand the truth and so we can take the truth to the world and show them how great God is and show them how good God's ways are. Would you say that Bill is making a good or bad decision? Good one. Yeah, I think so. Now, Chuck is a totally different person. He graduates high school and he decides to go to seminary. But he wants to go to seminary so that he can learn all about God and all about the Bible and so he can take it to all the punks who used to argue with him all the time uh-huh. and prove them wrong. Mm-hmm. So he can outgun every single one of those jerks. Yeah. And so he can be puffed up in his knowledge and his pride and say, I know way more. Chuck wants to be a Pharisee when he grows up. <laughs> Careful. Yes. <laughs> There were some really good Pharisees. The Pharisee movie started as a really good thing. Yes. But let's be real though, it got pretty much messed up. Would you say this is a good or bad decision? Bad. Bad. That's just well, the intention. The intention is, yeah. the intention is definitely wrong. We, assuming that he knows that it's wrong to be... Prideful. Let's just assume that both of them understand at least that much. Yeah. Look, the action is exactly the same. Yeah. It's ex- there's, let's say they do the exact things. Take the exact classes, read the exact same books. The action is the same, but for one of them, it's a good thing. For one of them, it's a bad thing. Mm. It's incredible. Hmm. But there Here's a question. Is God to determine because... Now, yeah, like when we, we can't, you know, I can't look at Bill and say, Oh, Bill. Oh, Chuck. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, now, look, here's the thing. We, we can judge the external like action Chuck. to a degree. Right. To a right. degree. And we can at least approach Bill and say, look, man, what is, what's your intention here? Because it looks like you're doing something really bad. Or Chuck. Or whoever. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Person X and person Y. Yeah. Say, person Y, what are you doing? We can approach people and say, hey, look, what are you doing? But we can't presume to know the whole story because we're right. little tiny human beings and we can only see so far. Right. Mm-hmm. To a large degree, if someone says... These are my intentions. Even if you think he's lying, you've got to leave it to God. Because yeah. you don't know. Yep. Don't presume you know. Here's a question. <sighs> uh, Old Testament. Thou shalt not murder. <laughs> Here's a question. Is it wrong to kill a human being? Well, you're getting into the difference between murder Flip and it around. Is it sin to kill a human being? Not if it's in yeah. self-defense. You said murder, not kill. I, I just changed it. Okay, you changed it. <laughs> well, I said, that's no, not murder, but then I said, is it sin yeah, to murder. kill? I used kill, not murder intentionally. Murder and, and kill are two different things to me. And so we've got, it's not the same, overall on the one side. Was it sin for him to kill those people? Yes. Yeah. I think probably so. Yes. Yeah. As far as I can see, yes. Mm-hmm. Almost definitely. Yes. 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 Now, let's take... General George Patton. Mm. He was responsible for some deaths. Do you think it was sin for him to kill the people he did? Now, none of us in this room can say yes or no. However, I at least am willing to very, very definitely concede the possibility that it was not. I think it could have been a mixed bag depending on the intention of his heart. Exactly. Each moment. Yeah. But I'm willing to, if I'm willing to admit the, the, the possibility that it wasn't said for him. That he was doing something for the good of humanity. Yes. Exactly. But yes. it's an action, right? It's the same action. Yes. If you're Killing a person to, who has invaded your home to protect your family? Right. Yeah. I wouldn't bat an eye yeah. at saying, God has no problem with you, man. Yeah. God is saddened by the fact that this happened. But I don't think he holds you responsible for that. Yeah. It's our law system is the same way. It's intelligent, at least to some degree, self-defense. But the action's the same. Here's a question. Is lying always wrong? Hmm. Is lying always sin? Probably. 
Probably. Probably. Because I can give you an occasion in which I'm pretty sure God was happy that a lie happened. Well, it's true. I know. Let's go way back to Moses. I know. The uh, the Egyptians are killing all the Hebrew boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what happened to Moses? The Hebrew midwives lied to the Egyptians. Right. And hid his existence. They lied to them. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not lie. Mm -hmm. Did they sin? No. I don't think they did. Does that mean that God can lie? Does that mean that God can lie? <laughs> no, I don't think it means what, what I think we're saying here is in terms of intentionally deceiving a person, whether it is a sin or not depends completely upon your intention of heart. Now their intention was to save a human life from wickedness. I don't think I'd have a problem with that. I think you would have preferred them to lie to save that human life, then let wickedness have its way so they could follow the letter of the law. This is the exact same problem the Pharisees ran into. They were so obsessed with following the letter, they missed the heart of the thing. So to them, it didn't matter. Your intention didn't matter at all. Neither did God's intentions there. So worried about the Sabbath, they wouldn't let Jesus heal human beings who needed help on the Sabbath. You're just like, what are you? God gave the Sabbath for man. Not man for the Sabbath. How did you miss the point so completely? You know, that's a, uh, those are, it's an interesting question, but there's a lot of them. For everyone like Patton, if you say, because Patton was um, um, a leader in, you know, during the war against a, um, an evil regime. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, you can think of a lot of things. I mean, Custer, okay? From... A pioneer moving his family out to the plains looking to live, he had no problem with him killing as many Indians as he wanted to kill or needed to. And right. where where does that fit? Because you also have the you know, US of course settlers been wiped out by Indians. He would be more than happy for that to occur. So that it's a real there's a lot I don't know if where we a definitive answer. Well, and I've saw it, and I, you know, and I've been in some um, deadly force situations, yeah. and and I've saw it, and I still don't know. Uh, you know, it's against my grain to be a pacifist. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, it's hard for me to say, and yet sometimes when I read with Christ and He's talking about the forgiveness, all that stuff, and it's like. You know, what are we holding on to here with the flesh? Are we refusing to allow someone to kill us? Why? Where we're going home to him, aren't we? So, I mean, I, I don't know what the answer I'm just saying that I have thought about that. And I find a lot of conflict. And I'm, you know, to come down and, and to say, I mean, I love my family. I would, I would you know, want to protect exactly. them 100%. But we're protecting our flesh only, right? It's not our spirit. So, I mean, I mean, all the people that got on the trains and went to the gas chambers. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they should. I mean, it's against my nature to say I would do that. I wouldn't want, you know. I got to get the books on for, for everybody in here. <laughs> but I, I don't know that I'm... <sighs> yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Yeah. Which is why I didn't say it was not sin for Patton to kill those men. I don't know. No, I don't know. Yeah, uh, much better, I, I probably shouldn't have even gone in the direction of war. I, don't think, I do think it's a valid point. Yes. But I think in terms of self-defense protecting your family, I think it's totally valid. Yeah. I, I don't think God has a, I, I, this is my opinion, obviously. But I don't think God has a problem with a man protecting his family from death. Here's the thing. God ordered a whole lot of wars to happen. Yeah. That God didn't change once there's a new set of books called the New Testament. He didn't change. Jesus was a revelation of the heart of God from the very beginning. Here's what I think. I think in every case that violence is not necessary for God to accomplish the highest good, he will never, ever have to go. He never wants to go there. But he will if he has to. Apparently, because he yeah. did. Yes, right. He did, he did yeah. a lot. Yeah. Apparently it was necessary a whole lot. And it's going to be necessary. Maybe. I, I hope not. Maybe not. Maybe mankind won't be so stupid as to make it necessary. Yes. But it's happening all over the place every day. I don't hold out a lot of hope for that. <laughs> I don't need to. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't yeah, and you're talking about the you know Indians. My my thinking on that is you know 
if your if your caravan of wagons is attacked by Indians, heck yeah, you know, protect yourself. But if you're just wandering along and they're minding their own business, you're like, hmm, that's a pretty choice piece of land right there. I think I'm gonna go get that by slaughtering all of them. That's yeah. probably a sin. Yeah. And look, here's the thing. We, we can at least say this much. And there are people who would say this doesn't apply because the Old Testament God was different from the New Testament. But I strongly, strongly disagree with that. I strongly disagree with that. I think the old, God is God. He doesn't change. The same people who would say he's a different God in the New Testament would say God never changes. So make up your mind. But what's very clear to me is the Israelites would have been wiped from the face of the earth within years of getting into Canaan if they had not defended themselves yeah, over so and happened. over and over again. Yeah, so yeah. I have to tell you about the Custer story. Custer Stanley was wiped out, and he was a little boy and saw He got a scar here, and he escaped. And he vowed that he would kill every Indian, which, of course, the heart attitude was sin. But he also adopted an Indian boy and raised him as his own. Hello? You that sure? was Custer? Yes. You sure? Yeah. Jackson, I know, had that problem. But anyway, was it yeah, I was just throwing that I out. As a, no, I totally had that. It's, not an it's yeah. Thing. And that's the thing. People will say war is justification yeah. for anything. Yeah. yeah. People will I'm in war now. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. This is why you have war atrocities and tragedies that happen all over the place. Yeah. War is the. And it's when you're hurt, like in a concentration camp, and you lose your family, you're going, oh, where is God? <laughs> That's even a whole other thing. Yeah, it is. Thing. But I mean, it, it creates a sin in your heart because now either you're going to, your heart attitude is unforgiveness. And yeah. It's a and again, again, bomb. It's really yes. difficult. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is the thing. There is, no, and this is what you're saying, there is no black and white. Oh, every, in this occasion, it's always sin. In this occasion, it's always not sin. No. God is the one who judges the heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, we can at least have a general idea because he gives us one. Yes. Yes. He gives us one and he gives us brains to figure out that this is not a problem whereas this one is. Yes. That lying on all these occasions is a problem whereas lying on that occasion isn't. Mm -hmm. Now I think, I think God would prefer a world in which no lie was ever necessary at all. Mm -hmm. In which no violence was ever necessary in which even in this kind of situation would never even come up. But we've done a fine job of creating a world in which sometimes I think those things are in order for a bigger plan to get by, to happen, for God's purposes to be put into place. I think God sometimes has to order the, the purging of an entire people group. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. Yeah. Either you can say God is evil or that was necessary. Yes. Because they were evil. Yeah. So. Yeah. Apparently, um, you know, we're, you know, we've, this was, that, everything we just talked about, I did not plan to, to talk about. I don't, have, <laughs> I don't have any notes. Uh, it's okay. The flying blood. I have a question. Yes. Okay. When David wanted to build the temple, if I'm correct, didn't God say he couldn't do it because of all the bloodshed? I'm paraphrasing, but... Yes, yeah. but... So what's the question? I'm just... Why would he... If he wasn't sinning in that instance, why would he keep him from building his temple? You can give me my That's opinion. That's the question I What's that? You can give me my opinion. Okay. The temple is symbolic of what, do you think? God's presence. The covenant. God's presence. God's presence. And by extension... Nothing that is in any way soiled. Yes. Nothing that is in any way touched by any of this. Right. It's not defiled. Nothing that is dirty, even a little bit defiled is a good word. Yeah. Now, David, David sinned. Yeah. Right about well, David. So did Solomon. Well, so did, so did Solomon. <laughs> yeah. I don't think the temple was built in any kind of perfect way in the end, in the way that it should have been. Um, David had people murdered because he wanted to sleep with their wives. Yeah. Just yeah. once that we know of. Shouldn't use the plural. Um, I, I, my opinion was, for David, a man who is so <coughs> famed as a warring king, mm -hmm. to erect a temple would have given it a lasting image that God didn't want attached to the temple. Mm 
I think God does things because of the way people will take them on for future generations. Yes. Yes. The way they will affect a culture yes. and a tendency and so on and so forth. Yes. For instance, and I'll just give you my, my thoughts. One of, the great, one of the laws, not great laws, one of the laws in the Old Testament is do not make any marking upon your body. So I'm talking about tattoos. Mm-hmm. So don't get tattoos, right? Right. right. Yeah. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Break out the, the iron or the iron scrub brush. Oh no, I've been forgiven, bro. Not until you get rid of those. Sorry. Well, that's the thing. When you look at why, because God doesn't have no reason to just I don't know because I don't like it. But you look at the cultures in the area, and that was something they did all the time. That was something they did as a part of worship rituals of abomination gods. What you do see over and over and over again is God doing things to make the Israelites feel separated from everyone else, to feel different. I think it's because he knew they would have a problem with mixing in with all the other cultures. And that would be a bad thing. Why do I think that? Because that's exactly what happened for a thousand years. They mixed in with other cultures. Their gods got mixed in with other, other cultures. How in the world did a nation like Israel come to a place, and not just once, but over and over and over again, where they had, oh no, over here is where we worship Yahweh. And over here is where we worship Baal. And over here is where we worship Moloch. Over and over and over again for thousands of years. Thousand. Single. How in the world? Because they let themselves mix with the other people groups. God did all this stuff over and over again. Look, okay, do this, and do this, and do this. Do not marry, do not do this, do not do this. Be separated from them. Now, I don't think that's a problem we face now. We, are our, we, we don't have a nation of Christians. We live in a nation in which we're surrounded by people of every religion and a lot who don't believe in religion at all. And it's not as simple as, okay, well, over here we have the atheists and all atheists have tattoos. And over here we have the Christians and no Christians have tattoos. So don't get a tattoo. It, it's just, you know, it's just, I mean, this is not how it works. My opinion, God doesn't have a problem with tattoos depending on your intention. Yeah. My opinion. I don't have any tattoos, so you can't get me on that one. <laughs> but I, but if I didn't, if I didn't think, if I thought that I could get a big tattoo right there, because I want one right there in Greek of Romans twelve verse two, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's what I want right there. If I thought that I could get away with it, I mean, I probably could. If I thought that I wouldn't put a stumbling block in the way of people who I want to minister to. I get it, because I want it as a way of evangelizing people who I meet in random places. What is that? What's that language? Let me tell you what it is. <laughs> anyway, that's my opinion. This young buck is giving you his young, uninformed opinion. About tattoos of all things. Um, so yeah, I think, I think God doesn't do things for no reason. I think a whole lot of the laws you read about in the Old Testament were given intentionally to have the Israelites be separate and yes. feel separate yes. from other people. Yes. God's chosen people. Now, <laughs> to a large degree, that backfired. The Israelites found a way to twist even that. Because what you see, even, even now, but especially then, the Israelites... They stopped viewing themselves as a missionary nation, and they started viewing themselves as the chosen nation. Not chosen to be a missionary nation, but chosen to be God's special people. Well, they were. But why? Because God wanted to bless everyone else. That is the promise that made them those people. We were adopted. Grafted in. Mm -hmm. We're Gentiles, though. Right. We are. Right. Now, we're grafted into God's, you, know, you guys are my people too. Right. The Israelites, Abraham was chosen for the purpose, right. you guys are going to be a light to all of the world. Yes. You guys are going to be the ones that I reach all peoples with. But instead, they came to view themselves as a special club, exclusive mm. to looking down upon and spitting upon Gentiles. You see it throughout the New Testament. You associate with Gentiles. Mm. Here's the, they, they took, be separate from these people groups, 
as you are way better than these people groups. Yes. That wasn't the point. Mm. Now, once again, I'm jumping off on the tangent. <laughs> but the, the Israelites had a long history, just like we do, yes. of taking God's very intelligent, reasonable commandments and finding ways to make them stupid and arbitrary and twisted. Yes. So, this has been fun, because we've just literally, I think 90% of what we talked about, I have no information on. So, <laughs> so well, you did pretty good for everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, now, when I say no information, I've talked about all this stuff before. I just don't have any of it written down in my notes. It wasn't your intention. It wasn't my intention, so God doesn't hold it against me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do you think that sin is the knowledge but the desire of our hearts are, if, if, we don't, if we don't stay in the Word and, and, and get that knowledge, like you said, knowledge or stupidity or whatever it is. Because for me, I know that sometimes the desire of my heart is, I want that. And, I, and I, either I have a choice to do it or not to do it. But Wasn't that your question? Temptation? Mm -hmm. yeah. so that's where we were week. going tonight yeah. 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 and that's where we're going to have to go next week yeah. is it talking about if we have next week if we have it next week because it is Easter Sunday ah. we that. so we, we might not we'll, I'll, we'll talk about it. I think is... we talk about desire yeah. and when you talk about temptation it's the desire of your heart here's something I do believe you said you know, our, our desires are going to be messed up until we learn more. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's necessarily always the case. Mm. No. I think it can be the case, sort of. Um, you, but here's what's scary. The more you learn, the more you are responsible for. Yes. Mm. I mean, a lot of people know that. They don't want to learn. <laughs> I used to be afraid to learn more because of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesus, didn't, he just said, hey, look, those of you who want to be teachers, you better Flipping careful. Because right. you're going to know a whole lot and you're going to be responsible for a whole lot. Yes. You know why that is? Because to he who knows and does not do, do, to him that is sin. And therefore to him who knows what he shouldn't do and does it anyway, that is sin. So when you have a full understanding of God and his purposes, full understanding of God and his purposes. Well, teachers, teachers are as full as we can. Yes. If you have a really good Relatively speaking, understanding of God and why he does things. It's really hard to get out through the loophole of ignorance. Yes. Yes. So that's the thing. Um, I think wherever we're at, I don't think there's a human being in existence who does not, at least at some level, believe that there are some things that he should and should not do. And whether those beliefs are right or wrong... I think our, uh, the conscience of every human being is at least active at some level. Yes. I think some things hold fast, which is why you don't see... We've never come in contact with a culture that believes like, and lives by the opposite of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. You'll find slight deviations, but they're really only slight. It's mind-boggling how even in cultures that have never had any experience with Judaism or Christianity, they follow to a shocking level, the basic principles. Lying is considered a bad thing. Stealing is considered a bad thing. Murder is considered a bad thing. Because our conscience are active at some level. And I, you know, I, once again, it depends on your intention, and yeah. so on and so forth. But when you talk about desire, the desire of your heart, I think there's, you know, there's different levels of that in terms of physical desire and pleasure and in terms of what you want at a metaphysical level, what you want to achieve, and so on and so forth. And then with temptation. And what, what is temptation exactly? Do we have to, do we have to be tem tempted in order to sin? No. Oh, no? No, yes. Yes? No. 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 Yes. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> we don't have to be tempted to sin. Do you have... Hmm. Wait. You may not always think. experience it as temptation... But what is this temptation? No. Uh, <laughs> we were talking what? about this. It's like, an oh, enticement it's... of the carnal self. So. Enticement of the what? Carnal self. So. Carnal self. So. 
Define carnal. Mm, oh, there we physical. go. Is physical 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 Another book written by John, the Gospel of John, to describe something that God really loves. Mm. Describe a whole group of humanity, it'll come in a positive way. Mm. And then you have flesh when you're talking about the physical, which is at least you know, treated neutrally in some places. And other places where the desires and the, you know, the whatever of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life and stuff like that. Um, I almost hate the word carnal. <laughs> of course I will. <laughs> <laughs> There, and, uh, and once again, we're, we're well, this, this is good. We're going to go a couple minutes over seven because I started late. Okay. It's seven, it's three after, so. Wow. We'll go for a couple of minutes. Um, the word carnal became popular because of the belief that, okay, we are spiritual only beings in a physical shell and all things physical are negative. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. So any <laughs> desires that are physical, any, anything that's physical is a bad thing. Yeah. Now let me tell you what that is. That is a Buddhist and a Gnostic thought, mm-hmm. not Christian. But didn't they used to have a physical body and used to whack themselves. Oh. You think that was right? No. <laughs> well, here's like, well, how is it now they're all pinching themselves under their clothes every day. Yeah, yeah. but didn't Paul use themselves. that term, uh, Cardinal? Didn't he, with, with, when he was talking about the, uh, the things that I do, I don't want to do, and the things I don't... I mean, he was using that terminology in there, correct? Yeah, now... So, I mean, his intention you, you, surely wasn't the same. You've got to take the translation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, now, if you look at, like, the King James or the NIV, you'll find carnal. Mm-hmm. But in general, you're talking about, like, a basic level of twisted morality. Yeah. Okay? You're talking about lusts. Yes. Yeah, I was... I, well, see, we're back to definition. Like, I, and it's a lack of on me... When we were talking last week about the total, there was a difference between a total depravity. And if you're, in, see, when I was thinking carnal, I'm, I was thinking of flesh in the, in the sense of a self, a serving self versus serving God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think at the very least, and this is the thing, I, I wouldn't say the word and concept of carnality mm-hmm. doesn't have a place in theology. I just don't like it because of the way it's been used. To say that everything physical is negative. Yes. Now, we're going to go into this next week because it has everything to do with what a desire is and whether desire itself is bad. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not asking the question. I'm telling you this is what we're going to be talking about next week. <laughs> if we have it next week. Because I, this is what we were going to spend the whole class on tonight. So... Um, And you're, you're right, Jim, that it has everything to do with your belief of sin nature. Yeah. If you believe you're totally depraved, then mm-hmm. carnality is a very appropriate term. Because it means that every desire you have is sinful. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't saying that you were. No. I'm just saying that would be the logical conclusion. If you're totally depraved, you only sin. And you only want to sin. You are completely and utterly sinful. So every desire that you have is going to be a desire that's going to lead you to sin. Mm. Now, the question is, 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 is desire always sinful? Do you have to be tempted in order to sin? What is the connection between temptation and desire? Mm. And then, and this is, we we're about to get there, the question of why have all of us sinned? Because apparently we all have, everyone in this room, at least once. And according to Romans chapter 3, all have sinned yes. and fall short of the glory of God. So apparently everyone has sinned. And you could actually debate that verse because the word all is used in other places by Paul two chapters later to describe a reality that is obviously not universal. When it says, through Jesus Christ, salvation came to all. If you take all as meaning literally all in the same way that it does, or that we say it does in chapter 3, and even in chapter 5 where it says, through one man death came to all, Adam, 
Yes. <laughs> this is where it was like mm. flipping theological and scriptural interpretation hypocrisy. When you say death came to all people from, from Adam and that's why we have sin nature and salvation came to some people through Christ and the word all there means different than what it did three verses earlier. You can't do that. You can't. So anyway, that's a whole side thing. You really got to look at, you know, uh, what all means. Does it always mean everyone or does it mean some people? Because obviously not all are saved. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. par- so apparently. Not all have sinned. Isaiah says not all have sinned, right? I, I think all have sinned. Because in multiple places it does. Mm-hmm. But I was saying you have to be careful with the word all. Because yeah. in chapter 5 it says, death came to all and then salvation came to all. So... <laughs> Hmm. You, you, you can't change the definition halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> From the same speaker, words, mere words later. And it's the same word. Same word. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Same Greek word. It's not a trick. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be really easy if it was as easy as, oh my gosh, it's a different word. And yeah, it's a different, the, it's a Greek different defini- the Greek dictionary yeah. tells me that it's a different. It means only some. And I don't know why they call it all. <laughs> if, if only it was that easy. Anyway, apparently, I, I, I think all people have sinned. Yes. At least once. Yes. The question is why? Mm-hmm. If you believe that God hates sin, if you believe he doesn't want us to sin, if choice. you believe that sin is... What? Because we have choice. Well, yeah, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> you're, getting <me> ahead. <laughs> you're getting me ahead of myself here. Okay. <laughs> there are basically two beliefs. Two beliefs that it boils down to. And I'll, I'm going to... F- we got two minutes. I'm going to throw you guys a bone here. Yes, don't I'm going to jump ahead and we'll, we'll, pick, we'll pick up this earlier. If you believe that God hates sin, he, that he does not want us to sin, that sin is hurtful and destructive yes. and is stupid, yes. why in the world do we all do it? Hmm. Now, I'm going to ask you next week what your personal opinions are. Like, oh. what reasons do I sin? What reasons do I think everybody sins and has continued to sin? Apparently, it's like, God didn't create us for it. He created Adam and Eve and he said, this is good. Mm. He saw his creation and said, it's good. He didn't say, this is good except for that one flaw I baked into them. Mm. The sin flaw. He said, it's good. Then something changed. Now, there are two basic answers here. There are shades of, uh, shades of these answers. Two basic, uh, basic answers. I'm not going to write them down. <laughs> basic answer number one. Basic view number one. We are all born sinners or have inherited a sinful nature from Adam. That's big view number one. Mm. We're all born sinners or have inherited a sinful nature from Adam or both. We're either born guilty because of his sin or we're born with the total depravity that forces us to sin all the time. That is the orthodox classical reformed view. Now, there's an obvious strength and obvious weakness. The strength is, that's a really simple explanation for why everyone has sinned. The weakness is, if it's true that we're all sinners from birth, how are we guilty in any meaningful sense of the word? If we have a depravity that is forcing our every move, how can God justly consider us guilty for our actions? And you can't say his ways are higher than ours. That verse doesn't work. <laughs> God has given us a concept of justice he's laid out in the Bible. I don't believe he's the kind of God to have a completely different, opposite view of justice outside of the one he gave us. That's an arbitrary view of the world. So anyway, that's the big weakness and, mm, of that view, the strength and the weakness. And the second view, the second view is this. All of us have individually chosen to follow Adam and Eve. Every man is his own Adam, and every woman is her own Eve. We've chosen to follow in the path they've given us. God created us as moral creatures with the freedom to choose between good and evil, and we have all freely chosen stupidity and evil. Now, once again, there's an obvious strength and weakness. Obvious strength, if that's true. Um, If we all sin because we have chosen to, it really strongly upholds a sense of individual responsibility and accountability. Mm. Which I believe uh, the Bible appears to support. Yes. We're all individually accountable and individually responsible. Now the weakness is that's a very poor explanation as to why every single human being has chosen to. 
if we all had the free choice, why have all the billions upon billions upon billions of people all chosen that one? Mm. Why didn't at least one human being that wasn't part of the incarnation? Oh, there you go. Why didn't he slip? Why didn't even just one human slip through that giant net? Mm. So those are the two basic views. <laughs> and with that, we will pick up either next week or the week after. I will wow. let you guys know. Wow. Good one. Any questions? We're